You're listening to Energy Futures on The Science Show. I'm Carl Smith. At the moment, you can hear two very distinct sounds. There's quite a constant sound of rushing over the mic, and there's a very gentle kind of whooshing noise in the background there with a man named Miles George. Miles, can you tell us what those two different noises are? Sure. Most of the noise we can hear here is background noise. As the blades pass by the tower, they slow down just a fraction, and that's what creates that whooshing noise. There's also just a very gentle kind of electric hum here as well, isn't there? Yeah, there is. So that sound is the mechanical sound of the components up the top of the turbine, the gearbox and so on. You can hear that when you're standing underneath the machine like we are now. You can't hear it when you're more than a couple of hundred metres away at all, whereas the whooshing noise tends to travel further. So I'm Miles George, the Managing Director of Infogen Energy. We're Australia's largest owner of wind farms. We're at Woodlawn Wind Farm, I'm guessing 30 kilometres out of Canberra, and we're underneath one of the 23 turbines that we have located at this wind farm. And that's just part of an array of wind farms generating enough energy to power half the homes in Canberra. That noise from the turbine has become central to the discussion on whether we'll see more of them. You're listening to Energy Futures on The Science Show, exploring Australia's energy resources beyond fossil fuels. So, Miles, again, it's quite noisy in here, but a very different kind of noise. What's this sound? The sound you can hear inside the base of the turbine is the mechanical noise primarily of the gearbox, which is at the top of the tower. So we have a a rotor and then behind that a gearbox and then behind that a generator. And what you can hear now is the mechanical noise of the gearbox and the generator. How big is this space at the base of the tower here? It's around four metres across. We're in, it's a steel tower. Uh, It's in multiple sections. And of course, people who work here need to climb up to the top to do work on the machines. A machine like this today is more than double the size of a machine 15 years ago. Up close, they are immense structures, and they are the fastest growing energy source in Australia. The latest data shows between 2000 and 2012, the amount of electricity generated by wind turbines in Australia has increased by 36% each year. The latest turbines are larger, smarter and cheaper than they've ever been. How fast was the wind moving over the microphone up there? I think it was 15 metres per second, which is about 50 kilometres an hour. It's pretty fast. Now, when we look at these turbines, they are huge, at least 70, 80 metres tall. Give us the dimensions that we're talking about with these things. These machines are about 80 metres high. Then they have a a blade, which is 44 metres long. So it's an extremely tall structure, as you say, a steel tower. And then on top of that, the blades are fiberglass, a typical three-bladed rotor. And then in behind that rotor, you've got a, a large gearbox, much the same as a big ship's gearbox. And then behind that, you have a generator, and that's generating the power, feeding it down cables, down to the ground and to the substation. 15 metres per second, 50 kilometres an hour is a huge amount of energy coming at these things. Big 40-metre blades moving in them. They're automated, aren't they, to track the wind? There's a lot of smarts in the machine. The basic technology is relatively simple, but the smarts is really in the way the machine is controlled. So they yaw around to face the wind all the time. They have anemometers mounted on them so they can test the wind speed and direction at any time. And the machine moves to capture the maximum wind. They also have blades which pitch just like an aircraft propeller pitches its blades in order, again, to maximise the wind energy capture. We can see some of the blades are actually bending with the force of the wind. It's, it's a fair bit of pressure on these things, I'd imagine. Sure. The blades are designed to flex their fibreglass, and out at the end of a 44-metre a blade, you could get a couple of metres of flex in the blade, and I think you could see that today. Do they shut off at any point then? They do. So when the wind speed gets up to around 25 metres per second for these particular machines, that's about 90 kilometres an hour, the machine shuts down itself to protect itself from any damaging wind. By the end of 2013, there were 68 wind farms like this one operating across Australia. 
Between 2012 and 2013, the amount of wind energy in our electricity mix jumped from about 2.5% up to 4%. That expansion is expected to continue. How are you going, Carl? Welcome to Windlab. I'm Dr Nathan Stegall. So Windlab's been going since... The team at Windlab are wind chasers. They measure and model the breeze, looking for the best sites to install turbines. There are so many good sites available, and even though they're not quite as windy as the ones that got built in the early days in South Australia, we're incredibly lucky in that respect. We've got a large coastline, a lot of which is reasonably windy, but we also have across Victoria, New South Wales, and right up into Queensland, right up to far north Queensland, we've got the Great Dividing Range. There are huge amounts of large windy areas along the Great Dividing Range suitable for wind farming. The whole of southwest Western Australia is extraordinarily windy, so Australia is a very lucky country with regards to wind and solar. If you look at our wind resource, it's extraordinary. It's many, many, many times more than what we need to provide all of our power, in fact. Today's evidence comes straight from South Australia. So the state of South Australia produces over 30% of its electricity comes from wind today. That's an extraordinary result given that that's all happened within the last 10 years from a base of zero. That can be quite easily replicated across all of the other states in Australia. There's really no reason why we can't aim for a very high wind penetration in our near future energy mix. Wind turbines are a proven technology, but they are still evolving. And Nathan Stegall says that means they'll be able to tap into even more of Australia's wind resource. I mean, the reality is, is that it's a relatively new industry. 20 years ago, there was pretty much no wind energy installed around the world. But the costs have fallen dramatically, particularly with the increase in size of turbines. One of the interesting things with the wind resource is that as you go higher in the atmosphere, the level of wind gets higher. And so these larger turbines that reach up higher into the sky, essentially, and have bigger blades that can capture more of the energy are many times more efficient than the older generation of turbines. Back at the Woodlawn Wind Farm, Miles George from Infogen Energy says not only are wind turbines able to tap into more of the wind resource, they're doing that more efficiently. There's two factors that go into efficiency. One is the theoretical capture of the wind, A modern three-bladed turbine is very good at doing that, capturing close to the theoretical capacity to capture the wind. And the other factor is what is the energy capture relative to the maximum that could be achieved if the wind was blowing 100% all year. And in Australia, and including at this wind farm, it's around about 33% thereabouts would be typical for a wind farm. That is, the amount of energy that's generated is about 33% of what it would be if the machine was running flat out all year. In Australia, you can get significantly higher capacity factors than that. We have, in Western Australia, over 40% capacity factors. There are others like that, particularly in Tasmania, very strong wind. So it, it depends very much on the location. And that capacity, is is that a function of the technology or of the wind resource that is available? It's both. So the the technology has improved significantly over the last 15 years. The machines today are more than double the size of machines some time ago. The fact that they're bigger means they're higher up and the wind speed is higher as you get above the land. That is a big factor. Then the other factor is wind speed itself, which is very variable. You have people like us and others who go out looking for sites like this one that exhibit all the characteristics you want for a good wind farm and they are obviously good wind, close proximity to the electricity grid so we can connect our power up and also importantly community acceptance. It's really important. We build assets that are going to last for 25, 30 plus years. We want to make sure we have a good relationship with the local community. So we've always treated that third criterion as just as important, if not more important, than the other two. It's sort of a pulsing sound that goes through everything, goes through the house, might affect you, mightn't affect me. Apparently it has, it's like seasickness. I'm hopeless at sea. I'm over the rail very quickly. Uh, Whereas a lot of other people just don't bat an eyelid. Some people get headaches, some get sick. It has different effects on different people. Tony Hodgson, he's the chairman of the Friends of Collector, a group of residents living near the Woodlawn site. 
you've got a view from your property out to some of these things, but others are proposed even closer. Just how close? Well, the nearest one, as I understand it, is going to be about 3.7 k's from our property. Do you notice them, I mean, in terms of both their look and potentially their sound as well? Well, no, I can't say that we hear the sound, definitely not, although I've seen some studies saying that you get the sound up to 10 kilometres away. Neither my wife nor I have noticed it. I've had people try to tell me that they're a beautiful thing on the horizon. Well, I just think that's rubbish. They're an obscenity. What is the sound? You know, what, what do you notice well, when you walk a, under there's, them? There's, there's a massive movement in the air. There's a big, might sound childish, but it's like a big whooshing sound. So in terms of those health issues, what have you heard from people living in this area, living near the turbines, for example? Well, there's a lady who's in the Friends of Collector who lives over near the Gulleran Range, and quite often they have to leave. You know, they have to leave their property to get some respite and get some sleep because of the infrasound that pulses through their house. There have been a few government studies around the country, though, that say that there isn't any discernible health risk. What do you say to that? (laughs) I won't use my normal language. It's rubbish, you know. The NHMRC has been, uh, in my view, a disgrace. They haven't done the job they're supposed to do. There's a Senate inquiry that's coming on the next couple of months. And that's going to get to the truth. That's been our position at the Friends of Collector and talking to all the people in the various landscape guardians across New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia. We want the studies done. Do you see a place for them anywhere? Yeah, as long as they're not subsidised, right? Of course, but put them where the people aren't. Put them out the back of Broken Hill or, you know, in, in the desert somewhere. Don't dump them in people's backyard. I mean, there are cases in Victoria where they're next door to the house, 50, 100 metres away. They treat you with disdain, absolute disdain. You're listening to Energy Futures on The Science Show. I'm Carl Smith. We've just heard some of the reasons why rural communities have been opposed to wind farm developments. But Miles George from Infogen Energy says wind turbines are safe and they're often embraced by those living in the country. There are a couple of issues which I'll talk about. One is visual amenity, what they look like. The other is the noise from wind farms. On visual amenity, they are what they are. We can't change that. Some people like the look of them, others don't. That's just a fact. So in general, though, we find that people don't mind them, whilst we accept that some people don't like the look of them. In relation to noise, there's very scientific and thorough process to test what the noise effect will be from any wind farm. Here in New South Wales, we've got the toughest wind energy noise guidelines in the world. And what those guidelines require is that there is a minimum amount of noise at any affected residences. And we have to comply, and of course we do comply, with those requirements. And as I say, they're very tough here in New South Wales. Generally in Australia, they're extremely tough. The other effect that I didn't mention is health effects. So a number of people have claimed health effects. And of course, we take very seriously any concerns that residents or neighbours to our wind farms have. But at this stage, at least, whilst there's been many, many studies of the health effects of wind farms, none of those studies have provided evidence that there are any direct health effects from wind farms. And that includes Australian studies conducted by the South Australian EPA, the Victorian Department of Health, New South Wales Department of Health, and most recently the National Health and Medical Research Council, all of whom found there is no credible evidence of direct health effects from wind farms. So, as I say, we are very sensitive to local communities having concerns about that, but to date there's certainly no credible evidence. Have you ever lived underneath one of these things or, you know, nearby? No, I haven't lived near one, but I've spent a lot of time near them. Um, I've worked in this industry for 15 years. I've had a lot to do with landowners who live near them. And just using this wind farm as an example, if you ask the local residents around here, you will find the vast majority of people are very strong supporters of this wind farm. There are a few who are not, and we understand that, but uh, the vast majority support it for the economic benefits that it brings to the region and for the fact that for not only farmers who have turbines on their property who have some drought-proofing income, that's great for them, but also for neighbouring properties and the local township. If you go into Bungendore and ask them in there, ask the local Chamber of Commerce or the Mayor or whatever what they think about this wind farm, they'll tell you they think it's great because it brings business and economic development to the township. 
If those community issues can be negotiated, there's still another big impediment in cost. Or at least there has been. Costs have been coming down quickly as more turbines are produced and as production moves to countries such as China and India. The cost of wind energy has come down dramatically with the increase in scale that's occurred over the last 15 years. To the point now where in some jurisdictions globally, wind is now competitive with other technologies like coal and gas. But it's important that we compare apples with apples. We're talking about comparing new build technology, like a new wind farm with a new coal-fired plant, for example, and in particular a coal-fired plant that has the appropriate emissions controls on it. If you're talking about that level, then wind is becoming competitive quite quickly. The issue in Australia is that wind energy has to compete with 50- and 60-year-old coal-fired plant that is already fully depreciated and therefore is only paying its short-run marginal costs, we call it. In other words, just covering the cost of its fuel, all of the plant's already written off. So wind's competitive in new build, not so competing against 60-year-old plant. But I don't think anything would be competitive with 60-year-old plant. Last week we heard wind is predicted to be one of the cheapest energy generation methods in Australia by 2020. But that's only for onshore wind farms. Offshore wind energy can be harnessed, but in Australia it isn't expected to be as competitive because of high maintenance costs. Now, Miles George is not just the head of Infogen Energy, he's also the chairman of the Clean Energy Council. And he says in any discussion on costs, there's another factor that could make all renewables more competitive. And that's how electricity use is changing in Australia. OK, so I think the main change will be a substantial move away from what I would call the centralised generation model. That is where you have very large generators historically established near coal fields and then a large radial transmission network to users. That is inherently inefficient. Large losses occur over the transmission network and the transmission network itself is very expensive to build and to maintain. The new model for electricity generation is what we call distributed generation, which is about having the generation that you require for your electricity close to where you use it. Classic example being solar PV on people's house roofs. But that concept will extend to other things. So, for example, remote mine sites will have their own power, probably provided more and more by renewables rather than diesel because it's cheaper and there's lots of other benefits. We will see community and regional power developments that don't require access to the large grid. So I think the biggest change is that change from centralised generation with large transmission to this distributed generation model. Then if you look at the technologies of generation, associated with that move will be a move away from coal-fired generation, which is ideally suited to very large scale, and the renewable technologies which work in much smaller scale, whether it's solar, wind or, or other things. For wind, it's variable between night and day, different times of the year, different times of the day. Uh, solely you've got an obvious impediment with night time. Storage, I think, is an area that people are looking to for solutions at the moment. Do you see that as something that will evolve and, and how do you think that will happen? I think storage is the next big thing in power. Storage in particular because the price of particularly lithium-ion storage at the moment is coming down rapidly and shows many of the characteristics of what happened with solar PV where the technology costs come down rapidly and all of a sudden it becomes competitive and then it will really take off. So given those changes, over the coming years, which methods of electricity production are likely to be the front runners? Wind energy is the most cost-efficient large-scale renewable energy technology and so wind has tended to capture a large part of the large-scale renewable development that's occurred in Australia. Solar PV technology has been rapidly coming down the cost curve such that it is now much more competitive than it used to be. It's still not competitive in large scale with wind but it's becoming much more so. But importantly it's found a very strong application in distributed generation and the best example of that is rooftop solar for households but it's expected that that will continue to expand into commercial rooftop solar for warehouse roofs, shops, hotels and so on that will become a very strong market for solar PV. The other technologies which I guess are coming along behind, in other words, still not as cost-effective but have some potential in the future, are geothermal. 
and wave technology. They're probably the most common ones. The one I haven't mentioned is hydro. Hydro is very effective, but we've tapped out all of our resource already here in Australia. Miles George, head of the Clean Energy Council. 